last talk back uh, in Craig about uh, estimating the cost of implementing some circuits. Uh, the first question that the chair just asked was like, oh, are you going to talk about the cost of factoring? <laughs> no. Can you speak louder? Sure. We'll, we'll pull the mic up. It's going to be about a much more uh, boring problem, I guess, but a much simpler one to explain how to compile it. So uh, I guess my apologies in advance. So the, the basic plan here is I'm going to lay down some context for what the regime we're working in is, or at least the one that I'm thinking in. I, I know that all the other talks have seemed very like theoretical and high level, and this talk is going to be very much the opposite, where we think about more of the details of what things turn into. And I kind of want to get into more theorists' heads, like what are the costs of the things that you're talking about? Uh, and then I'll start going through some of the building blocks, which is just going to be like a somewhat poor surface code review. And then I'll talk about how we're going to put those building blocks together into this random circuit sampling pro problem. Uh, and then we'll give some numbers at the end. So context. Uh, I'll just lay out the reason that I'm talking about this. So first of all, it's important to understand the cost of fault tolerance in order to know like, when will we be able to do these things and should we spend more money now to make them happen sooner or should we wait and these kinds of prioritization questions that, that companies care about. Also, it's, it's sort of nice to have these simple, well-defined problems that you can come back to and say, oh, using these things over, I learned over the last year, this is now cheaper or easier to do in some way. So it's nice to have a baseline. And also, it's nice when you can tell experimentalists, here is a thing where if you have this many qubits and this much fidelity, you could do this. Uh, and maybe that's interesting to them. So uh, I come from a team that does superconducting qubits. So most of the things that I have in my head are related to superconducting qubits. So we kind of imagine that your qubits are laid out on a grid, and that you have 2D connectivity to nearest neighbors, um, that we expect gate fidelities on the order of 99.9%. .9%. So when you have an error, and by an error I mean a random poly, like a depolarizing error, um, that should happen about one in a thousand times when you do the gate. And I'll mention this later, but when we're doing these estimates, we're not really thinking in terms of the physical gate error. We're thinking in terms of, at the logical level, what does the physical gate error mean for us? And in particular, what we care about is how much uh, logical error suppression we get as we increase the code distance of, of our constructions. So what we want is five decibels of suppression per code distance. But what we tell hardware people is we want 99.9% fidelity. Uh, in terms of the speed of the hardware, superconducting qubits are pretty fast. They can do gates in tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. And in terms of the, sur in terms of the surface code, that kind of caches out to we want to be able to measure all the stabilizers that are present about a million times per second. And also, there's the problem of the system you wrap around your quantum computer in order to control it and keep things going. And that system will have some speed that it's able to do a measurement and react to it to pick another measurement to do. Uh, and that's also an important speed when, for these systems. And we kind of assume that that's going to be around a 10 microsecond round trip time. So that you can do about 100,000 sequential things at the logic level. So another caveat is the, the numbers that I'm giving are not fixed in stone in any sense. Like These numbers keep changing. Uh, they have been getting better over time. So don't get too depressed when I show this next slide. So <laughs> currently, fault tolerance is very, very expensive. And you can tell because of the number of zeros on this slide. So on the right, there's uh, a classical AND gate, which is a couple transistors arranged into a circuit in a particular way. And that'll do ANDs you know, 10 billion times a second for as long as you want. And on, and on the right, the, this is like a magic state factory. 
you don't really have to understand what that is. The point is that it's, it's kind of big. And when you work out how many qubits you're using for how much time, you end up with numbers that have like 10 qubit seconds. Um, if you ever hear people say things like, Grover speed ups are not enough, this is why they're saying that, is because you need to overcome this starting penalty of 10 billion or a trillion, depending on how you run the numbers, before your algorithm really starts coming out ahead, uh, which is why you really, you really want an exponential speed up, at least given, given these sorts of numbers, in order to overcome that penalty. Uh, so as I mentioned, the cheapest thing that we know how to do that's hard to do classically but easy to do quantumly is to just generate a random circuit and run it because that's the thing that the quantum computer natively does uh, and the kind of unpredictability of the gates or the fact that there's no structure to them makes it very difficult for classical computers to simulate them. And of course the downside is that it's not really a useful problem. Like maybe you can use make certified random number generators out of them. Uh, and also, it's not easy to check that it's working. But, well, here we are. <laughs> let's, let's move on to describing the, the surface code. And the first thing I'm going to do is just stay on this slide for a couple minutes and talk about all the pieces of a little surface code patch. So when we talk about the surface code, we're talking about like this, this checkerboard pattern of parity checks. So each of the black squares here is a four body operator that we're going to measure as often as we can. And each of the, the white squares is also a four body operator, but in another basis. So one of them is you know, Z's and the other is X's. And the idea is that if you have an error happen somewhere on the chip, like say here, that error is going to be X or Z or X times Z, or it'll decompose into something, some sum of them and so it'll cause these stabilizers that are next to it to flip, and that'll allow you to identify that an error happened and reverse it. And in order for an error to actually be undetected, you need a whole chain of them, which goes from one side all the way to the other, like you get uh, an X flip, and then another X flip, and then another X flip, and another X flip, and then another X flip, and then you don't see anything wrong, but your qubit was damaged. Uh, I've also highlighted the kind of logical observables so these are where we're storing the information. So any, any qubit is just an anti-commuting pair of observables. And here is the anti-commuting pair of observables in red and in blue. Uh, there's also these kind of boundaries uh, where you do these two-body measurements, which is good because you don't want to have to go off to infinity in real life. Uh, and also, it's very hard to make chips on a torus. So it's, it's nice that they stop and that we know how to stop them. Uh, so I don't know if people can see this very well, but I have shown these little yellow circles for where the data qubits are. I haven't shown any for the measurement qubits, but essentially you can think there's like another grid offset by a little bit where the measurement qubits are living. Uh, and you can tell it's distance five because if you count the dots, it's one, two, three, four, five from one side to the other. Now, unfortunately, a distance five qubit like this is not good enough to do much computation with. It's like experimentally interesting, perhaps. And you could demonstrate a lot of things with such a qubit. But if you want to do computations with it that are classically difficult, you need something bigger. Uh, and in particular, I think you need something around distance 13. Uh, so that's around 400 physical qubits. And when you take this, uh, we have this way of approximating what we expect the, error, the logical error rate to be per cycle based on simulations that Austin Fowler has done. Uh, and based on those, you sort of expect this 5 dB of suppression per code distance with an initial offset of 3. And you, you just plug in that equation, and then you switch from uh, decibels to probability, and you get like a 10 to the minus 8 chance of failure of this qubit per cycle. And you, given that I said we're going to have these cycles at about a megahertz, that gives you a half-life of about a minute or two. So this will last about a minute before you kind of start expecting that there's been an error and the qubit's no good anymore. Now, if you want to do computation, you, of course, need many qubits. Uh, and if you want to do classically intractable computation, you need more than 50, because people can store that much in disk. So we're going to need 60 of them, or maybe, yeah, 60-ish of them. Uh, and so this whole system now has a smaller half-life, because each of the individual qubits could fail. And there's 60 of them, and their half-lives are a minute, so 
perhaps not surprisingly, the system half-life is around a second, you know, 60th of a minute. And now our total physical qubit count is getting more to around 2,500. So, so this is how we're going to store the inf information, is, is this is the layout. And now how are we going to operate on it? So there, there's a style of performing operations in surface code called lattice surgery. And basically what I'm showing here is a lattice surgery where you have an initial configuration where you have two qubits that are separate. And then you measure out the, cube, the data qubits in between them to prepare them into a known state. And then you kind of just turn on the stabilizers connecting the two qubits. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to determine the, like the XX parity between those two qubits, or the ZZ parity, depending on which sides you joined. Uh, the way that you can tell that that's happening, uh, I've highlighted in red here like these kind of diamonds. Each of these diamonds corresponds to one of these uh, stabilizers. And if you multiply together every single one of them, you're left with you know, these three qubits uh, in X times these three qubits in X, which is exactly the observable that I claimed we were measuring. So you, you are, in fact, measuring the, the parity, and it's right there. Uh, it can become quite inconvenient to have to show all of these diagrams in terms of these time slices. And so we often use this 3D notation where uh, we only show where the boundaries are of the qubits over time. So here, like this, this square or this cube, this pipe, corresponds to this thing here, just going through time towards the right. And then when they're joined together, well, there's a crossbar here joining them together. And then afterwards, they're going to split back apart, although that's not shown in the uh, time slices here. So there's going to be more of these types of diagrams. And I know it's, it's unfortunately difficult to get used to reading them in the span of a 30-minute talk, but uh, it's also difficult to get used to reading the kind of configurations, uh, the time slices. So I, I don't actually know how to explain the surface code really well in 30 minutes, unfortunately. So that was the sort of two qubit measurement. Uh, we also have single qubit operations. So an important one that maybe doesn't seem like an operation is just reorienting the qubit. So if the wrong side is facing outwards and you want to fix it so the other side is facing outward, how do you do the three-point turn to get the qubit into the right orientation? So we, we used to do this with more space, but then uh, Daniel Latinsky found this way to do it with just a two-by-one section. Um, you can kind of maybe follow how the boundaries are moving around here. Or you can look at this, and you should picture in your head like a barber pole where the colors are just going around gradually, except it's been kind of discretized and in order to avoid having any two of the boundaries get too close to each other. Because our error, our um, chance of error is ultimately determined by how close does you know, this black boundary on the face here get close to the black boundary on the other face there. And so there's a lot of restrictions on how you can move things around. Uh, in, in particular, the thing that I like about this one is it has this little, little notch, which I would not have come up with. And I think it's great. Once you have the patch rotation, that's the majority of the Hadamard operation. So what, what I'm indicating here, this little yellow strip, is that you apply Hadamard to every single one of the data qubits. And what this effectively does is it People call it the transversal Hadamard as if it does a Hadamard to the logical qubit, but it gives you a logical qubit oriented the wrong way. And then you fix it with this patch rotation, which you actually spend all of the time doing. But ultimately, the point is you can do a Hadamard and you can fit it into a two by one footprint. Uh, there's also a construction to do the S gate in a two by one footprint, which is more complicated. You don't have to understand the details of this slide. Uh, this, this is actually still not published. Like This is something I figured out last week. but. Uh, the point is you can do the S gate. Uh, and this, this is something that I'm quite happy about, because they used to be much more awkward. So those are like the basic single qubit operations. And in combination with the ability to do that parity measurement, you can actually do the entire Clifford set. That's, that's maybe not so obvious. Like That was one of the things that was surprising about lattice surgery initially, is that you could get the C0 gate out of these parity measurements, but you can. And so C0 and H and S together are universal for Clifford. Of course, we don't want to do just a Clifford computation because that would be classically tractable. They're, those circuits are easy to simulate. So we need some other gate. In this case, it's a T gate. But I'm not going to be applying T gates to individual qubits. I'm going to be applying them to polyproduct observables, like you know X on the first qubit times Z on the second qubit times Y on the fifth qubit or something like that. 
So when you see this like big box with a little T next to it, you could imagine in your mind, you know, preparing each of the qubits into the correct observable and then putting the parity all into one accumulator qubit and applying a T there and then getting it off. Um, in practice, that's not the way that we're going to do it, the way we're going to implement it. We have an efficient way of doing this. Uh, but if you're, if you're conceptually confused about what this means to phase uh, a multi-qubit observable, this, this is what you can have in your head. We're going to phase the minus one eigenstate by 45 degrees, and we're going to leave the plus one eigenstate alone. Uh, and the reason that we kind of care about this generalized thing is in lattice surgery, the difference between, oh, I'm going to apply, apply a T gate to one qubit, and I'm going to apply it to many qubits, is like adding on more of these connecting elements between your T state coming in and your data qubits uh, going up through time. Uh, and this, this is an extremely small difference. I, I'm actually exaggerating the spacing here just so that you can see it. In practice, these, the separation is not of order the code distance, which is what it looks like here. It's of order one. I mean, it's literally one. So uh, we need to be able to do these T gates, but they're not native to the surface code. And the way that that's done is you perform magic state distillation, where, which is a process that takes in multiple noisy versions of a state and outputs a smaller number of more reliable ones. Um, and every once in a while, you, you know, fail some sort of check and you throw away the state. Uh, so here is a circuit which performs magic state distillation. This is also from Daniel Latinsky. Um, and as you can see, it kind of has this property of we're just applying T gates to various poly product observables. And so this is going to fit pretty nicely into lattice surgery, which is uh, this next slide. So again, this is, it's not incredibly important that you understand all of the details of how this works. I just want to have in your head that there is, this, there is this structure and we are performing the distillation. There are a bunch of tricks in, in this to make it a little better. So in particular, you might notice that the sizes of the pipes are not symmetrical here. They're like, some of them are like squeezed. The reason for that is there's some errors that are detected by the distillation process, even if they, if they occur in these pipes. And if they're detected, we're willing to tolerate them happening more often. And so we move the boundaries closer together. Uh, another trick that's happening is normally, every time you inject a T gate, you, you either perform a T or an inverse T. And if you perform an inverse T, you have to fix it by doing an S gate because you went the wrong way by 45 degrees. Uh, you're off by 90 degrees and you have to fix it. But it turns out that sometimes there are ways of simplifying which S gates you do if you build up a bunch of them over time. So normally you would have to do an S gate for every single one of these, but it turns out that this particular system has some nice properties that guarantees you need at most five of them. And so I'm using that to reduce the depth of this structure. Uh, without that trick, it would be much deeper. So, so there's these kinds of like algebraic properties going on behind the scenes here to, to make the depth lower. So to review the building blocks that, that I've established, we have this five by 12 board of distance 13 qubits covering about 2,500 physical elements. We have our single qubit gates, we have our generalized T gate, uh, and we have our distillation procedure. And now we're gonna put that all together into an algorithm. So the basic idea is we're going to cut out some of this space and use it as a working area. Uh, and we're only going to be operating at any given time on the qubits that are adjacent to the working area. But we're able to move it. Uh, and the way you move the working area is you actually move the qubits to the right of it, to the left, or, or vice versa. Um, so there's enough space, because all of our single qubit operations are two by one, for us to do a Hadamard gate or an S gate to every single one of those qubits in the active area in parallel in uh, like depth three because that's how deep the Hadamard gate is. Also, this is enough space to fit the T, the T state distillation. And also, it's enough space to fit that like generalized poly product T and to connect it to some subset of the qubits. So basically what we're gonna do is we're just going to sweep the thing back and forth, picking random poly product observables to phase, you know, being careful to make sure that they anti-commute with the one before to prevent it from being too easy, and do that for as long as we can. But uh, you know, we have a second of, of time to work with. And 
it turns out that they need to back up the envelope calculations and that it seems like it's enough. So here I'm just adding together all of the things that I talked about and some that I didn't to say like how quickly do we do this cycle of moving and doing the generalized T and so forth. And it, it happens about 4,000 times a second. Based on other back of the envelope calculations that I'm not going to show, it seems like if you do a thousand of them, you get enough mixing, so that's classically intractable, like pr probably way more than enough. And you're still getting only like a, only like a 90% chance of error, which maybe sounds bad to theoretician, but if you talk to hardware engineers uh, for a system that big running that long, that sounds amazing. Like the, the supremacy paper, I don't know if anyone here like read the details, but the fidelity at the end of that, of the circuit that they ran was 0.1%. Uh, so they had to run a lot of repetitions to see that signal out of the noise. So that, like 10% sounds completely amazing. Uh, also, in the, the like NISC supremacy experiment, uh, it was like depth 20. And given the, the ordering of how the gates work, you could maybe get a signal from one side of the chip and back in, in that amount of depth. But there wasn't a lot of time for round trips of information. There's just enough time to get things mixed once. Where here, it's going back and forth about 100 times. So like, it seems like there's a lot more um, buffer. So I think I might have gone too fast. But no, it's not that bad. Also, it's the last, it's the last uh, talk, so no one would care if they got to leave early. <laughs> um, in summary, it looks like you would need 25,000 qubits to do this. Uh, it might be possible to get a little lower. Uh, and if we're doing 1,000 operations, then it takes about 0.25 seconds to get a sample, and you get about 10% fidelity. Uh, so I'm just going to talk for a minute about why would you possibly do this, given that it's already been done in NISC. Like this, this thing, random circuit sampling, is so great at having a quantum advantage that you don't need the fault tolerance. But the thing is, if you want to really make the argument that the extended church Turing thesis is false, you need a system that you can scale up. And so the asymptotics actually apply to it. If you took the current NISC system and you, you tried to scale it up, you need to wait for the hardware engineers to improve the error for each of the scale ups you did. And so there's like a certain important practical sense in which you can't make asymptotic claims until you have the ability to, to easily scale. Uh, also, like just the numbers are a lot better, um, so that like, it would be much more uh, compelling in a sense. But I mean, people here probably have opinions about that, so maybe I'll open it up to questions now. chip or would this need like quantum information being transmitted between chips? That, that's kind of a complicated question because there's different levels of it could be on a different chip. Like you could imagine chips being in different fridges or just being next to each other and connected in different ways. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the current plans are in, in terms of like what size of chip it would be. I imagine you would not want to try to fabricate a device that had that many elements on it that were quantum in nature and have it expect it to work well universally across it. So I guess maybe the answer is I'd expect to use multiple chips. Yeah? Uh, you talked about, uh, at one point, performing gates in parallel within this sliding window. Yep. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, like, the, the way that hardware is set up, is it, is it natural to perform gates in parallel? Like yes. For super yeah, for superconducting qubits, it's very natural to do the gates in parallel. Like, there's a separate wire going to every qubit with its own microwave signal. It's not like uh, ion traps where there's this kind of shared laser that where they could be interfering with each other. Okay, and the, and the reason for limiting the window is just because there are only so many wires or something? No, no, act actually every single one of these, when I say they're idle, I don't mean that they're not doing anything. They're actually very, very actively constantly measuring these stabilizers in order to prevent errors from accumulating. Uh, I just mean they're idle from like the logical algorithmic sense. And the reason that I did that was purely to avoid having to have uh, even more space. If I wanted them all to be active, I would need a space next to every one of them, and it would essentially double the cost. Okay. Okay. But 
but in principle, at, at double the cost, you could perform a gate on like a like a bunch of disjoint pairs of qubits yep. across the entire grid. Yeah, yeah. If you put like access hallways uh, here and there and there, and also a connecting one along the bottom, then yeah, you can do a parallel operation across every single qubit in the the system. That's actually. Uh, one of the like architectures recommended in Daniel Latinsky's paper, where he doesn't ever bother doing any Clifford operation to the qubits, he he just keeps applying T gates and uh, targeting the correct poly products. Yes. Would the results change considerably if you change if the connectivity was different, like if your qubits were more connected or let alone fully connected or? Um, it, it's really complicated because you might even switch your error correcting code under that situation. Uh, certainly, if you had two layers uh, and they could cross talk, the surface code has a transversal CNOT, which is much cheaper. Uh, so, yeah, it would probably change the cost, but it's difficult to say how without specifics. And even with specifics, it's a lot of work. Yes? Uh, you. This is an embarrassingly naive question, but I always wanted to ask, uh, why is the surface code the best option? There's many quantum codes. It's, it's because it has a good threshold and because it has this planar structure. That, that's kind of what it comes down to. So has the technology to perform all these steps has been invented yet? Or are there still like, unsolved problems no one has an idea how to solve? When you say steps, could you be? To make those qubits, like made to make uh, twenty-five thousand qubits. Uh, yeah, no, there are a bunch of technical challenges that prevent us from simply building it immediately. For example, um, the the cryostat, like the fridge that we put it in to keep it cold, only has so much cooling power. And if you tried to fit this many qubits in and all of your wires, you would overwhelm it. So you need to make a bigger fridge. Um, and also, the wires are heavy, and like the support structure around it would collapse. So you have to fix that. Like a, a ton of individual technical problems that must be solved. Or is, in a way. From the theory side, from the theory side, I feel like we're kind of ahead of the hardware. Um, I, I'm. There's a lot of software that has to work. Uh, so there's a lot of programmer work that, that also has to be done. But I feel like the theory side is pretty robust. Um, in particular. People have thought of things that you might not have thought they'd worry about, like, what if there's a qubit broken in the middle of one of the patches? How do you deal with that? And we have a nice way of dealing with that. Or the physical hardware is not technically qubits. They're harmonic oscillators. They have you know, a zero state, a one state, and then a two state, and a three state, and, and all the way up to wherever that breaks down. Um, and we have a way, or we worry about what if they leak out, how do we get them back in? Uh, like when I show these stabilizer configurations and I show them staying in place, that's not quite right. What we intend to do is to have everything like constantly jittering back and forth so that qubits spend about an equal amount of time of, as data and measurement because you can reset your measurement qubits and that gets them out of the two state. Yeah. So, as a theorist, I'm desperate to see results out from uh, checking everything codes. So has um, experiment been done on say the five by five Arrangement for the service code? Not yet. We, we definitely want to do that. Um, but we, we want to do it like processing the, the information online instead of offline. So it, it's just a lot of work. Is there any fundamental reason why uh, this experiment is not done in earlier? Uh, I, I mean, hardware has only recently gotten to the point where it, it would be viable. Like, you need to. You need your error rate to be below the threshold in order to see an improvement as you go from distance three to distance five. Uh, so in that sense, it's only recently that it could have been done even in principle. And, and other than that, it, experiments are just harder than you think. Um, you, you, <laughs> you, you, yeah. What did you said is uh, beyond our imaginations worth of being difficult. Well, yes. it, then you will figure it, out. It's not, it's not always even like, big fundamental obstacles, it's like, oh, the, the power went out today and the fridge is warmed up. <laughs> we, better, we better have power back up in the next building. Like, uh, there, there's a million little things that can all go wrong. And you need to get all the pieces working very well and consistently well in, in order to see stuff like this. So, so does it mean it's mostly an engineering problem? 
for the distance five experiment, yes, I would say it's mostly an engineering problem. There's no theoretical obstacles or unknown hardware things. It's it's a matter of a lot of people doing a lot of work to, to make things work well all the time. Yes. So given that on classical chips, one of the main barriers is just getting the heat out of the chip with respect to the clock mm -hmm. speed. You know, you were mentioning that you know it, it is challenging to get the heat out of a very large number of these qubits. Is has the sort of thermal envelope of this <coughs> uh, figured out? Uh, I would say no, but I'm speaking beyond my knowledge at that point. I, I will say I don't think we have the same problem classical machines have, where they're trying to go as like as absolutely fast as possible. Like we, where the speed that we run is kind of determined by the physics, in a way that's. I guess the classical speed is also determined by physics, but <laughs> I, I've never heard someone say, "Let's run the qubits faster." Oh no, it'll get hotter. Uh, I, I don't think it works that way. It's more like the qubits wouldn't work as well that they worry about. It. Yes? Uh, the numbers you gave in the last slide, they are all relative to the 60 qubits that you mentioned earlier? Yep. OK, and if I want more than 60, how much faster is it? How, how well, I, I mean, if you want 100, I guess you could multiply this by 100 divided by 60. But you probably need to make the co-distance go up a little bit because you have a bigger system in order to prevent it from decaying quickly. So that, that will add this. Um, every time you want to make the system 10 times bigger in, in space time, you probably want to increase the code distance by 2. And given that the current code distance was 13, you would go up to code distance 15. And so you'd multiply by 100 over 60 times 15 over 15 times 15. And that, that, would, that would tell you. Well, I, I was just wondering, like, let's say you had this thing, like, what would you run? But maybe I should ask you again. And what's the use case? I, I mean, when it's that size, this is basically the only classically intractable thing you can do. But there's all kinds of fun experiments you can do to test that it's working. Like, you, you just run Clifford circuits all day long, and you can check very well that they are doing the correct thing. Um, just validating every one of these constructions, like, that, um, that these single qubit gates work, and that the distillation works, and just all kinds of validation experiments is what I expect people to run. Uh, other than that, because at this size, you can't really do anything else classically intractable. I, I guess I'm sort of the type of person who'd be like, well, then you should use a classical computer instead. But there, there are simulators that will do anything else. Yeah. If uh, we can sneak in the wish list, uh, it would be nice <laughs> if you try to verify everything and find out what doesn't go as well. Yeah. We're either going to make a quantum computer or we're going to figure out quantum mechanics is wrong. All right. <laughs> either of those is a good outcome for, for us. Thank you.